we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed the church as an equipping center in carrying out the Great Commission let's start from Matthew chapter 28 from 18 to 20 Matthew 28 from verse 18 then Jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age this is what we have termed the great commission go the great commission now the word church so we are looking at the church as the equipping center the word church lends itself to a lot of interpretations a lot of them such as the called out ones the aggregate of the new creation it also means a temple or a meeting place somebody can just point his hand to a certain house or building there and say this is my church he's only telling us that this is where our church meets and then it also can be referred to a particular service. I am going to church for a particular service then it can also refer to a denomination like the church of Pentecost as an institution then it can also refer to a job a man maybe a father can introduce his son to a friend and say that my son has joined the church what the father is trying to say is that my son has become a clergyman so some of these interpretations of church will be used but so far as this topic is concerned I'll be oscillating between the church as a gathering of believers in service or worship and the church as an institution so I'll be looking at the church as an institution and the church as a gathering of believers as gathering of believers so the mandate of the Great Commission is bigger than evangelism going out to win souls and bringing them to join the churches the mandate of the Great Commission is bigger than that It is converting people from the world and discipling all nations. It is about going out there and discipling all nations that is possessing the nations with the values and principles of the kingdom of God. The focus of the mandate is therefore outside the four walls of the church. You see, Jesus' commission was to the disciples by extension the church. And then he told the church, go, go. So the focus is not in the church. The goal is to go outside the church. So the focus of the Great Commission is not in the church because he was telling the church to go and make disciples. So the focus is outside the four walls of the church. So the Great Commission is not fulfilled by church-based activities like singing in the choir or leading bible study and all that now these activities form part of the in-house service to strengthen the church the great commission really happens outside the walls of the church now so when we are talking about ministry real ministry it's not being the or maybe leading a bible study you can't say that my ministry is being a deacon all that we do in the church is to help us strengthen us to take charge of the great commission so that is not ministry the church is to prepare us for real ministry which is outside the church the church therefore is not the focus of the great commission yet the church is the most important tool for carrying out the, this commission for the lord our god 
it is the most important to, if you like, it is the two. It is the vehicle God uses to equip his people for the work of the ministry to possess the nations. It is the equipping center. The church is the equipping center. The church is the equipping center. A training ground where believers are prepared as army of God to impart the society with the kingdom principles, lifestyles, and values. So the church is the equipping center where believers are prepared to go out there and take the nations. Christians are equipped in the church to make maximum impact as salt and light in our world. When Christians lose sight of this and make the church a place of conservation and escape, many people then come to church today because they want to escape from demons, forces of darkness. So all our teaching is about God will protect you from ancestral curses, from that and that. So we, we come to church as if we want to escape. That is not the focus of the church. The church is to prepare us and unleash us into the world. So when we make the church a place of conservation, we are conserving gifts. People are there and we don't care about the world. And a place of escape, we work then against the Great Commission. We work against the Great Commission. See, the early church had a national focus. And they brought nations to their news before God. They had a national focus. The Daniels and the Meshach and the Abednegoes, they had a national focus. They dissolved themselves into the nation. And the Nebuchadnezzar praised God because of factors like Daniels and the rest. So we must revive this ambition of having a national focus because we need to prepare the church and then get into the nation. Our forebears sang take the song again, but just try and picture some 40 years ago when our churches were on the trees. For me, our church was in a cocoa shed. And sometimes we go to church and half of the house is packed with cocoa. And then we are also worshiping at a certain half. Now listen, look at how small the church was. But they had a national focus. They had a national focus to the extent that when prophecy came about God giving them Africa, they believed it. They were not satisfied with being just at Asamakasi. They thought that they had to go to Takwa and overthrow Patanji. Yeah. They were worried about what was going on on the mountains. They didn't want Akonodi to succeed. We need to have a national focus. We don't have to lose this ambition or else we work against the Great Commission. We work against the Great Commission. Let's go to the kingdom method of evangelism. And now we shall look at the parable of the weeds. The parable of the weeds. Matthew chapter 13. Now we want to pay attention to this particular parable. We'll read from verse 24 to 24. 30. Matthew 13 from 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed Yes. Then the weeds also appeared. Now it says 
the weeds appeared. So one is intentionally grown and others two are appearing because it was unauthorized. Somebody did it secretly. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the weeds with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then, gather the weeds and bring it into my barn. Now, see the conclusion of this seems to be against what he has said, that let, let them grow. Because they wanted to remove the weeds early. But he says that let them grow. But at the end of the day, he's saying that the weeds will be removed. So the disciples didn't understand this too well. They went home. They requested for a better interpretation. So let's go to verse 36. We'll take 36 to 38. 36 to 38. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Now he had said a whole lot of parables, especially in Matthew chapter 13. Even between verse 30 where we ended to 36, he filled in with other two parables. But they were interested in this parable of the weeds because of the difficulty they had in understanding it at face value. So, he explained to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. Now, so lift up your heads and please look at me. He's saying that the field is the world. He didn't say the earth, the world. So he's talking about the world and the world system. And then he says that the one who sowed the seed is the son of man, the head of the church himself, Jesus. He says the good seeds are the subjects of the kingdom. So that when we are born again and we come to his fold, he sows us back into the world. So the subjects of the kingdom have always been God's method of his evangelism. He sows us back into the world. And so all of us cannot play ostrich to what is going on in the world because we have to be sown back into the world. All of us who have to be sown back into the world. So the subjects of the kingdom have always been God's method of evangelism. Jesus' says prayer in John 17, 14 to 17, seems to buttress this very point. John chapter 17. Let's start from 14. Can we read together? I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am. The next verse, please. My prayer is not that you take them out of, but that you protect them from the evil one. So God is not going to take us out of the world. His strategy is to plant us in the world. Next verse, please. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So we are planted in the world. We are not the weeds. There is difference between the wheat and the weeds. We are not of the world. We have been planted in the world. The next verse, 17. Let's shout this one. Ready, go. As you send me into the world, I have sent them into the world. How many of us do not love for God so love the world? That he gave his only begotten son. So we, as he sent him into the world, so has he sent us, every one of us, back into the world. 
So we ought to be concerned about the culture that rules our world. Because that is where real ministry is going back into the world. If the sons of the kingdom who are sown into the world system, we are sown there to change the world system. If we are sent to change the world system, then we need to be prepared. So let's go back to John chapter 17, there verse 14. We need to be prepared. Let's look at how Jesus prayed. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. So before he said, I have sent them, he says, I have prepared them. I have given them your word. We talk about the armor of God. It's nothing by equipping the people with the word of God. So he prepared and he sent. So that is what the master did. So we too have to prepare the church and then send the church to achieve the task that he has for us to achieve. Are we together? Are we together? Fine. The church, therefore, is the breeding grounds for raising godly men and women who are willing to apply kingdom principles and values to bring transformation to their respective societies. The church is the breeding grounds where godly men and women are prepared to bring real transformation to their society. Now, raising godly men and women to transform society. So we are saying that the church is where we raise real Christian champions to change society because we need to go there. So we are looking at raising men and women to transform society. We'll go back to the Old Testament and take a one-chapter book, Obadiah. Now, Obadiah, then let's read verse 17 and 21. We are taking the 17 because it is a, a very popular verse so far as this book is concerned. Even in the whole of the Old Testament, this one is a very popular text. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. Yeah. Especially the King James version of this. There shall be deliverance on Mount Zion. It will be holy and Jacob will possess his what? Inheritance. Then let's jump to verse 21. 21. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Let's take it from the King James, if we have. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the laws. The NIV says deliverers. And then the King James says saviors. And then other version says the rescuers. So whatever be the case, there are certain group of people, either you call them deliverers or saviors, they are going to come up from Mount Zion to rescue Jerusalem. Destroy the Mount of Edom, the Mount of Edom. Let me just break this one into pieces a bit. So, this prophet wrote a one chapter book, very short chapter, very short book. And then the whole story about this is about the defeat of Mount Esau. The Savior shall come out from Zion and then they will defeat the Mount of Edom. Obadiah is built on two related themes, namely the destruction of Edom and the vindication or the restoration of Judah. Now, it tells us why Esau or the Mount of Edom has to be destroyed. Then he says that it is because they mistreated their brothers, the Israelites or the Jews, when they wanted their support and their help. When the enemies were against them, they didn't allow them to go through their, their, their town 
And besides, they even gave them up to their enemies. And because of this, God is saying that I'm going to punish them. I'm going to punish them. But the few who are going to be rescued in Israel, God will lift them and make them saviors. And these saviors in Zion, on Mount Zion or Israel, they are going to destroy the Mount of Edom. Now, Jacob and Esau have always been signifying the spirit and the flesh. So when we are talking about the Mount of Zion as representing Israel, we are talking about the spirit. When we are talking about the Mount of Esau as representing Edom, we are talking about the world. So there's going to come a time that the church will rise as the highest of all the mountains and saviors will be raised in the church to deal with the world system. And let it be now. We'll deal with the world system. And I'm praying that it will be now. Now, Zion has always been a metaphoric kind of expression in the word of God. So we are looking at Zion, a type of the church. Zion, a type of the church. One would want to know where Mount Zion is and what is the real meaning of Zion in this prophecy. That is Obadiah. Now, the Hebrew word for Zion is Tishion, as it is spelled this way. The word refers to a Canaanite hill fortress in Jerusalem, captured by David and called in the Bible the city of David. After David's conquest of this fortress, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. Now, pay attention to this one. The royal palace was built there. And Zion, or Jerusalem, so Zion and Jerusalem is used interchangeably, became the seat of power of Israel's kingdom. Now, in summary, you can always say that Zion referred to the city of David, the city of Jerusalem. Zion can also refer to the entire nation of Israel, the Jewish nation. And then it sometimes it's also referred to the millennial Jerusalem. And then the eternal or the heavenly Jerusalem or the church. Now, let's go to Zion sometimes being referred to the entire Jewish nation. It can also refer to the city of Jerusalem, the capital. Now lift your heads and look at me. Sometimes when you are listening to the news, instead of saying America, they can say Washington. Washington says, what they are trying to say is that America is speaking. Or you can replace Ghana with Accra conveniently. This is the message from Accra. We are talking about the headquarters of the nation. So we are saying that Zion here can represent Israel. It can also stand on its own as the seat of governance. Let's hold this. Let's hold this one closely to our chest. There's a mention of Zion in the Old Testament. You read about it. There's also, but there's no much mention of Zion in the New Testament. All the references to Zion is, are borrowed from the Old Testament. And our songs and our hymns also link something to Zion, trying to paint the picture to us that Zion represents the church of God, the church of God. So, but let's look at Zion and the church of God. Zion and the church of God. Though Zion at one time meant a physical dwelling in history, in the New Testament, it refers to the church, the new body of believers that come into being after the resur that came into being after the resurrection of Christ. But Zion is more than the church. So this is what I want you to pay attention to. I'm saying that Zion is more than the church. It is the seat of power of the church. Just as Jerusalem was the seat of power of Israel. Zion in essence 
foreshadows and symbolizes the kingdom of heaven. Mount Zion is a place where Yahweh dwelt among his people. Dwelt among his people. You see, I've said that Mount Zion has always been a metaphoric statement in scripture. The B.C. Zion was a foretaste of the A.D. Zion. Now, let's come to the New Testament so that we don't worry ourselves about Zion and Zion and Zion. But what I want you to hold on to is this. Zion is more than the church as an institution. It is a seat of power of the church just as Jerusalem was a seat of power of Israel. You can underline that one if you are still using your hand out. So Zion is more than the church as an institution. It is the seat of power of the church. What do we mean by this? Now, Hebrews chapter 12. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18 makes reference to Zion. Let's read from verse 18. You have not come to a mount that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, but to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that, that those who heard it beg that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death, if even an animal. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. This is Hebrews for you. He's always supplying the missing link. Now, from verse 22, you have, let's read together. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, 23, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, 24, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling blood that speaks than that of Abel. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews was not trying to compare two mountains. That is Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. He was not just trying to compare two mountains, their bigness or their, their, their tallness. But to contrast what happened the action that took place when Israel encountered God on Mount Zion against when believers enter God's presence in Mount Sinai. Now, on Mount Sinai, the people couldn't assess God. They were frightened. And Hebrews says that even Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. Then who else will go close? Let us take the rear account. Now, I want us to spend some time on this Zion, Zion thing. Now, we want to take the rear account. Instead of just reading the inference, let us go and take the rear account. What really happened on Mount Zion? Exodus chapter 19 from verse 9. Exodus 19 from verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Now listen. The Lord makes a voluntary statement that I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and concentrate them today and tomorrow. 
Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. All the people will see me. That is what God is saying. But limits, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Now here is God. He wants to reveal himself to the people. But he's still telling the people, be careful. I'm going to be on this mountain, but be careful. If you touch it, you'll be put to death. And Hebrew says that even when animals touched it, they died. Let's jump to verse 16. So all of us should prepare. God is going to descend now. Eh? Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was tender and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Now, everyone in the camp what? Trembled. You see, I, I presume that this is where the writer of the Hebrews got even Moses himself say, said, I am trembling. Because the Bible is everyone. So he didn't exclude Moses. Everyone trembled. Then verse 17. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. Now can you imagine mountain trembling violently? How many people will remain there? Yeah, even the sight of a mountain is intimidating. Now this mountain is also trembling. Because the master is descending on it. Hmm. Tremble violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. Moses went up and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must concentrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Still, the Lord has not descended. This is preparation. Eh? Chapter 20, from verse 18. When the people saw the tender and the lightning, and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you. So that the fear of God will be in you to keep you from sinning. The people remain at the distance while Moses approached the th thick darkness where God was. Now, this was Mount Sinai. God has achieved his aim. He was descending on the mountain so that the people would give reverence to Moses. Now, when the people said, Moses, it's okay. You speak to him. And come and tell us what he has said. God has achieved his aim. So now Moses then has been accepted by the people as the one who can stand before God. Because for them, they are afraid. That is Mount Sinai. But in Zion and on Mount Zion, this is what the Bible says. Christian believers have access to God. They have access to the invisible spiritual realm, into the heavenly Jerusalem, and therefore participate in the innumerable company of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. In Zion, we come to God. The judge of all, 
the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling blood that speaks better word than that of Abel. So look at the contrast. So in Sinai, they ran away. But in Zion, we have access to God. We have access to God. We don't need the Moses to go in here and come and tell us. We don't need any priest to be our between. No. We have access to God. Now, if God is descending on Mount Zion, angels will go before him and then they will go after him. I like our... our, our our forebears. You see, you can see a people's theology in their songs. Hmm. Uh, this song that they sing. To for The king of kings is coming. Yes. Then they say that righteous men are fronting. And then I'm sure the song was received by a woman. So they say women too. Uh, they just. Uh, but that one is theologically correct. No problem. But you see, if the president is to come here, before he gets here, an envoy will come telling all of us that the president wants to worship here. Now, when he says that, if the message came to Apostle Jesiado, he would call the general secretary that they said the president is coming. Then when he hears this expression, he would tremble. He would come and tell me that he said the president is coming. Did, did you know he was coming? No. Then this escort will be saying, where is he going to sit? Then all of us will be searching for a place for him to sit. And then if we said here, then they ask, who is going to sit if you say this man is from Benin, they say, no, Benin, sit there. Now, they want to make sure that around him is safe. They want to examine this seat. Meanwhile, the man has not started from whom? He is coming. He is coming. He has not started from whom? And then before he comes, you hear it. You hear the starring far away. That is why they heard the trumpets. They heard the trumpets. Who was playing it? No pastor. But the angels that were preceding heralding him were hearing, they were playing the trumpets. And the, and the, the tender, because the king of kings is coming. He's going to land on Mount Sinai. And the people said, it is okay. We, we can't face him. You Moses, please, go and meet him. Whatever he says, come and tell us. But in Mount Sinai, we have access to him. Now, what I want to say is this. Let us have that consciousness that when we meet, he is here. He is here. When we meet, he is here. When we meet, he is here. The writer of the book of Hebrews here refers to Mount Zion as a place of action, a functional church, a great gathering, a congregation and an assembly where the active presence of the almighty God with his host of angels is tangibly real. It is this God's empowering presence in the midst of his people that makes Zion the seat of power. So we can have Zion as referring to the Church of Pentecost as an institution. But you see, when we meet and we gather like this, his active presence in us, in a church, in, in a service, in worship, makes that place the seat of power. The seat of power, where things really happen. It is in such supernatural encounter with God at in Zion, that congregations of people of God, that the congregation of people of God, that saviors are birth and deliverers are raised. 
and sent forth into the world. So what I'm just trying to say is that unless we create that kind of atmosphere for God to come in the midst of us, we will not be able to equip members effectively. We will be doing church, but we will not be equipping saviors. So we need to be careful about the church setting, the worship setting. So brothers, consider the atmosphere of worship critically. When we talk about worship, there is a spirit of reverence that go with it. Reverence is key to encountering the supernatural. Reverence is key. Now we have gotten to a point where you go to some churches and when they are even singing, they'll be carrying chairs and some of them will be playing with a ping, ping, ping. They'll be carrying chairs. People go to church and they don't care. They go there with a girl who is not even married to him and then you put their hands there and then they are relaxed. They are listening to the word of God. Then they go to church. Pastors go with their phones and on the platform the pastor is making calls. In the midst of church service, the pastor is calling somebody. Then after he has finished calling the person, he takes the mic, he's coming to lead prayer. God is up there, he's watching. Now, when we take the rules of conduct of the Church of Pentecost, we had the original six of them. About seven of them was a preparation towards service. One of them said this, set aside a period daily for a personal quiet time in prayer and meditation on the word. So that you who is coming to church who is always being prepared for gathering. Another one says this, always endeavor to adequately prepare yourself through prayer and meditation before coming to the house of God. Because our fathers knew that the presence of God must be taken seriously. So he said prepare before you come. One of them also says this, be in your seat in good time before the commencements of service and participate fully in every aspect of the service. Now in my church, we have an English service and an account service. When the English service is over and they are about leaving, an elder in the account session will come and take the mic. While people are still conversing and they are, they are not settled, you will start. Look at it. The spirit in which he wants to start service. Whereas our forebears taught us that sit in your seat. Even before the service starts. So I wouldn't want that chaotic atmosphere to be where I want to start church. Please let the others leave. Let those who have come to church sit down and prepare their heart. Let them get ready to meet God. When they are ready to meet God, you will descend from heaven in our midst. Be in your seat. Then he says that, endeavor by word and deed to bring up your children the fear of the Lord and bring them up with you to the house of God. Supervise and monitor the activity and participation of your children in Sunday school and youth ministry and all that. Then, another one says that, make the church your spiritual home. Love the brethren with brotherly affection and if you are able, contribute to the needs of the saints. Then another one says that, endeavor to study the Bible diligently on your own and take it with you anytime you go to the house of God. Now we have gotten to a place where when people are even leading worship, they don't come with their Bibles. And we think that it is okay. Please, the Bible is our foundation. The person must always start from the Bible. If you will not start from the Bible because the setting does not allow it. The person can read the Bible in the middle or end with the Bible. Don't let us come with our own ideas even in worship. Let us make sure that we derive everything from the Bible. And this is the big one. Enter reverently. Pray fervently. Listen attentively. Give praise from a grateful heart and worship God in the beauty of his holiness. This is what our forebears said. Worship God 
in the beauty of his holiness. Reverence is key to encountering the supernatural. See, when Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, this is what he said. I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power. This doesn't mean Paul is afraid of them. He was talking about the reverential fear of God, the awareness of the awesomeness of God in the midst of his congregation. This has an impact on his responsibility as a minister. The Hebrew scribes, when they were writing the name Yahweh, they would go wash their hands and then they change into another costume before they come back. The church of God, we have to go back to the place of reverence. We need to go back to the place of reverence. It is his presence which will meet needs, solve problems, and answer difficult questions. Now we can gather, but when his presence is not there, needs are not met. Problems are not solved. Questions are not answered. Deliverers, saviors are not raised. Not at all. There is a move of the Spirit of God that will be lost in our generation unless we teach our generation and lead them to experience the presence of God. We need to. You see, when you are in a PIWC, and then we go to church on a, a communion service. And then we say we don't have to play instruments. People just will not understand. Because the choir leading the church now. Because the choir will sing. So they have to by all means play some instruments. So can't we have a service that is solemn for a moment? Can't we? We can have a service. So instead of just giving in to what our people want to do, let us teach them reverence that on a day like this, we want to remember the blood. Instead of maybe singing about the blood, the worshiper can just use songs concerning the blood to lead the worship. Let us create that atmosphere to meet with God. Both members and ministers have to be taught to prepare to meet with the Lord in Zion the city of God, the seat of power, the congregation of the saints. From the aforementioned, we have seen that Zion is a type of the church of God. So we can safely say that one of the purposes why Jesus established his church is for it to be a place from where saviors, deliverers are raised to transform society and change the mountain of Esau, the domineering and oppressing system of the world. They determine the running and functioning of our world, such as education, the business, economy, sports, government, and all politics. Everything that is out there, the governance of the world, we ought to raise saviors to go there and then influence the world. Now, when you look at the word saviors, shall be raised in Zion. And we all know that we have only one savior. At the first glance of this, you may think that, oh, the writer made a mistake. Instead of savior, he added S, but there's no error there. Just as God said to Moses and Aaron, I will make you a God unto Pharaoh, so have we been made saviors unto our world. So we have been made saviors Onto our world. Now, I'll put a comma here and then I'll come back again. So we are saying that in Mount Zion, granting the needed atmosphere, when it is really created, we'll be able to raise saviors and deliverers for our world. We don't have to play with the church setting at all because it is the seat of power. It is in church that things really happen. We can have the Church of Pentecost as an institution, but unless we create the presence of God in the midst of our services, nothing happens. There will be no life. The life is in the end of the church. 
is in when God is interacting with believers. It's in the midst of the innumerable company of angels. It is in the midst of when God is speaking better word than that of Abel. I pray that God will open our eyes of understanding so that we will be able to pick one or two from what I've said. The church is the equipping center. God bless us all.